can we talk about unions in general then what are the pros and cons of unions so the, the interest of the union maybe you can correct me if i'm wrong i have a lot to learn both about the economics and the human experience of a union the union's interest is to um what to protect worker rights and to maximize worker happiness not the success and the productivity and the efficiency of a company right no i would disagree um so i think a union's interest is in what's collectively bargaining on behalf of workers because in certain cases um you know i am uh, right now a manager at uh the nation magazine right um, if I have a problem with my working conditions or I need a raise or whatever else, I could, with my skill set, my background, my role in the company, I could go to my boss, uh, the owner of the nation, and say, okay, I need to renegotiate my contract uh, on these terms. I could bargain, right? Now, if I was a ordinary worker at like a CVS or something, if I didn't like my conditions and I went to my boss and said, hey, I need a $2 raise and, you know, I need to like be home by 830 because, you know, I, I, have, I have obligations at home. Uh, the boss would probably say, I'm sorry, that's not possible, right? You know, maybe try the Rite Aid down the street or the Walgreens down the street or whatever. Um, now, if I went to the boss at a place like CVS or even better, if all the pharmaceutical workers, um, you know, uh, at Rite Aid, CVS, Walgreens, went to our bosses and said, listen, um, you know, we collectively need to, uh, uh, $2 more and, and, you know, better hours, shorter shifts or whatever else, then they would probably have no choice but to concede. You have to bargain collectively at, at any level if, if you're an a ordinary worker. Um, and there are some exceptions, but that's for certain highly skilled workers, but even in, in, in those cases, of course, all workers are skilled. I mean, just the technical definition. Um, even in those cases, a lot of those workers have to bargain collectively as well um, in order to get more more wealth. But, but, it's, but they cannot make their demands so excessive that their firm gets out of business. So, so the workers only uh, are workers as long as they're gainfully employed. So often unions will uh, try to um, select their wage demands at such a level that it ensures that their firm will stay in business. Yeah, but the problem is the way firms go out of business isn't by an explosion, uh, like the uh, way popcorn starts getting cooked. Like you, at a certain moment, it just is, is over. You can, it seems like the union can, through uh, collective bargaining, keep increasing the wage, keep increasing the interest, of the worker until it suffocates the company that it doesn't die immediately, but it dies in like five years. So that might still serve the interest of the worker, but it doesn't serve the interest of society as a whole that's creating cool stuff and <laughs> increasing. So sort of a market that's operating and increasing cool stuff and constantly innovating and so on and uh, creating more and more cool stuff and increasing the quality of life in general. Is, I, I disagree with the premise because great. I think in your, even taking your example, that would be better for society. If a firm cannot pay its workers a living wage, but its competitors can, then that firm should e will either figure out a way to innovate, develop new techniques, new markets, new ways to be productive, or it should go out of business. Mm -hmm. And it would be better for it to go out of business than to stay in business or to be artificially kept in business in, in any sort of way. Um, and uh, yeah. So let me, that's, so that's, that's the Chrysler, my old um, centralized that's bargaining. The yeah. Right. Example. But, but then there is, you know, innovation costs money too. So the flip side of that, I think to play devil's advocate is that it incentivizes the automotive in industry is a, probably a good example of that it incentivizes uh cutting costs everywhere and sort of whatever that's been making you money currently figuring out how to do that really well without investing into the long-term future of the company for like all the different ways it can pivot all the different interesting things it could do in terms of investing into r d whenever there's more and more and more pressure on paying 
a, a living wage for the workers, it might not, again, it might suffocate and die over the next five, 10, 20 years, uh, which might be a good destructive force from a capitalist perspective, but it might rob us of the Einstein of a company, right? <laughs> uh, of, the right. of the flourishing that the company and the workers within it can do over a period of five, 10, 20 years. Well, this is just a problem with a lot of capitalism, which is about short-termism, right? Because the same thing could be said from, you're starting a company, you have a plan for it to make a lot of money, but your investors want you want dividends right away. So you have to uh, take away from your long-term um, R&D or other plans and deliver short-term uh, dividends. That's often why a lot of, I think, R&D is often rooted in state institutions and research and whatever else is being drawn on. And, and also, I think that that's a reason why you know, the state has some sort of role in fostering firms in either a my version of a socialist economy or a capitalist economy or whatever else to help with these time horizon uh, problems. So I won't dispute that workers could play a role or wage demands could play a role in time horizon problems. But more often than that, it's coming from investors, it's coming from just a host of other market pressures that people might might have. And I would say that in the real world, a lot of um, investment funds don't come from just retained earnings. It comes from a lot of you know sources. So I, I think this is a problem that could be solved through public policy, but definitely exists today as well. So you mentioned living wage. Is there is there a tension between a living wage, and maybe you could speak to what a living wage means, and the workers owning all of the profit of the company? sort of uh, this kind of spectrum. No, I guess the spectrum is from like no no minimum wage, the lowest possible thing you could pay to a worker. Then somewhere in that spectrum is a living wage. And then at, at, the, at the top is like uh, all of the profit from the company is owned by the workers. So Sp split to the workers. I mean, I think that any society is going to have to make distributional um, choices. Um, you could have imagined a variety of capitalism in which workers are paid quite little, but there's extremely high taxation and there's redistribution after the fact. You could imagine a system in which there's less taxation after the fact, but there's more guarantees and regulations of how much people are paid before the fact. In my vision of a social society, there would be Similar way that unions work, and in, in my example, the centralized uh, bargaining uh, unions would, would work that bargain at the sectoral level and not just at the enterprise level like our unions do, do today. Um, there could be benchmarks set for different um, occupations or wages. Um, and the reason why you would want a benchmark at a worker-controlled firm is that you don't want workers self-exploiting themselves in order to gobble up market share or because you don't want them collectively deciding, okay, we're going to invest in this longer term time horizon and outcompete other people that way. So you might say, okay, if you do this sort of clerical work, you have to be paid uh, the equivalent of $15 an hour, and that's a minimum. But on top of that, you get, um, you get uh, you know, dividends from, from excess profits. Um, and I think it would also have to be combined with um, public financing, for expansions and for development, which could be done in quite a competitive way. So you could have a variety of, of banks, you know, in my vision, you know, state-owned banks, but what, how would they decide who to um, invest in and who to not invest in, who to give a loan for expansion to and who, who not to? Because you, you don't want it to be like, oh, I'm going to invest in my, my nephew's firm and not this other firm. Or I'm going to invest in this guy's firm because he's an Italian, but not this guy's firm because he's Albanian or whatever else. Just make it rational at the level of their goal is just like any other um, investment person at a bank today to uh, maintain a certain risk profile and to have an interest yield. Um, and decide to invest on on that basis. So if there's a huge automotive firm that has been on business for 50 years that needs a little operating cash, like, yeah, they could get their 
$50 million at a 3% loan. If you have some crazy blue sky idea and you manage to get it to that that point, like maybe you and your friends would get it at, you know, 12% or something close to what a VC would, would offer today. So I only kind of go into these details, not because to say that a system doesn't have to in advance map out all the different possibilities. But I think it does have to be willing to accept a lot of things that we know today. You know, I can't give you a version of socialism that's everything's going to be fine. We're going to live harmoniously and we won't have these sort of tensions. And, you know, you could hunt in the evening and, you know, fish in the, you know, afternoon and write criticism, you know, whatever else. Um, I do hope that there's horizons beyond this that we could aspire to. I do have those visions. But for now, I think our task as socialists is to imagine a, you know, five minutes after, you know, midnight, like, what what can we do right away within our lifetime um, vision? So that means through some level of central planning, reallocating resources to the workers. So I think the primary mechanism in this private sector under socialism would be a market mechanism, firms competing against each other to expand, uh, connected to a system of public financing. But even at that level, the individual um, bankers and, and public banks and so on would be operating based on their own rationality. And the state would certainly shape investment decisions, but maybe no more than they do in a lot of capitalist systems. So the state might already today in a lot of countries decide, you know, we want to invest in green technology. So it's going to be favorable rates for people or tax credits for people investing in green technology. So the state already shapes investment. Um, I think what should be centrally planned, and this is where like, I'm proud to sound like an old school socialist, is things like um, healthcare, things like um, uh, transit, things like our um, natural monopolies of, of lots of types, uh, you know, I think can be done very well through, um, through planning. And we already have plenty of examples. But a lot of this society, I think, would be would be the the private sphere of worker controlled cooperatives uh, competing against each other, weak firms failing, uh, successful firms expanding. 